What kind of world do I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster comes and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. First step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. The action I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between corporations, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. Welcome everyone to the session Driving Global Financial Inclusion. Thank you for joining us. My name is Eric Parrado. I am the Chief Economist and General Manager of the Research Department of the Inter-American Development Bank. And in that role, there are many things that I'm obsessed with. And one of them is financial inclusion. So I'm glad that the World Economic Forum is taking financial inclusion seriously. And this panel, a fantastic panel, is a good example of that. Of course, financial inclusion is a broad issue and many subtopics should be considered. Financial inclusion involves the needs of individuals, for example, through access to affordable quality financial products and services that lead to financial well-being. Businesses with their access to capital and adequate digital infrastructure to support growth and the broader financial sector, for example, with access to equity for smaller businesses and access to local and international capital markets for larger companies. But we only have 25 minutes, so this session aims to discuss public-private and private-private partnerships that drive financial inclusion for individuals and small businesses, given the digital acceleration brought on by the pandemic. And I have to say that the COVID-19 pandemic is a wake-up call to change the course of action of our societies and has particularly shown us the importance of having inclusive financial systems that can create resilience among households and quickly provide the boost to grow and create jobs during the recovery. In turn, important opportunities stem from this crisis, including the adoption of digital payments and access to financial services through online banking or fintech services. So we need to, to take advantage of this big push to bring high financial products to our most vulnerable citizens and businesses. There is no doubt that global access to financial services has increased substantially in recent decades. But still one third of the global population over 15 years old remain unbanked. In other words, there are 1.7 billion people who are not part of the financial systems around the world. Most of them live in developing and emerging markets. And moreover, important gaps are observed between different social groups, especially women and the poorest. This situation hinders progress on economic growth and development. We cannot allow this to happen. It's unfair to people 
and a bad business for governments and the private sector. In this context, the Inter-American Development Bank and their, its new development strategy, Vision 2025, is currently designing an initiative to further contribute to fulfill these objectives and to position Latin America and the Caribbean as a global leader in the promotion of more inclusive financial system. This financial inclusion initiative will serve as a key tool to assess gaps and propose policy actions to accelerate the access and use of modern financial services to all citizens in our region. But of course, we cannot do it alone. Nobody can do it alone in, in any region of the world. We need all type of partnerships to make it happen. And to help us with these matters, I'm so glad to introduce our panel. And we have with us today, Rania Al-Mashat. She's the Minister of International Cooperation of Egypt. And previously, she was the Minister of Tourism of Egypt. She also held high level positions at, at the Central Bank of Egypt and the International Monetary Fund, where I had the opportunity to meet her some time ago. We also have Fahim Haliboy. She's the head of the JP Morgan Development Finance Institution, launched in January 2020 to spur investment supporting economic development in emerging markets. Prior to JP Morgan, she spent 18 years at the International Finance Corporation, where she was responsible for setting a strategy, business development, transaction execution, and portfolio management. Last but not least, we have Calvin Choi. He's the chairman of AMTD Group and founder of AMTD Charity Foundation. He's a globally recognized entrepreneur and philanthropist, as well as a pioneer and contributor in promoting regional digitalization. What a great panel. And also, we have a great audience. So for all the people who is joining this session, remember, you can be part of this. You can send your questions to the panel through a slide. A final housekeeping message, the panel discussion will be on the record and made available within 24 hours on, to an online audience. Okay, so let's start with the first question to our panelists. So let's start with Rania. Um, considering the digital improvements made during the pandemic, where have you seen the greatest progress toward financial inclusion and development of capital markets over the last two years? And more importantly, what are the largest barriers remaining? Rania, please go ahead. Thank you, Eric, and I'm very pleased to join everyone, and hopefully we do this conference uh, physically next year in New York. Um, uh, of course, uh, COVID uh, was a huge shock. Nonetheless, there was some silver lining. And because uh, education services, because uh, e-commerce was so important, health services were very uh, needed, uh, many people looked uh, to find how they can secure uh, financial ability uh, to pay their bills. Uh, this was very uh, useful uh, because uh, it also allowed, if you talked about fintech, there were many startups that used the digital space to provide financial services to be able to include more people. This is something that we saw very vividly uh, within this uh, ecosystem of startups, fintech, uh, and, and innovative ways to be able uh, for citizens uh, uh, to pay for their education services, to pay for their shopping, to pay for their health. Uh, moreover, businesses, on the other hand, uh, also because they are, there's the supply and the demand, so there was uh, some compensation for the decline uh, in the physical transactions because there was this ability to do it digitally. Uh, nonetheless, uh, as you mentioned, uh, we have uh, around 2.5 billion working uh, adults uh, that are not yet, uh, uh, you know, within uh, the uh, financial or bankable uh, world. Uh, this requires uh, more regulatory uh, uh, openness uh, from uh, countries or governments. It also uh, calls for uh, more public-private partnerships, and I think this is something that we are going to dwell on uh, during the discussion. Thank you very much, Rania, for setting up the discussion regarding progress and also the barriers that we have. So probably we can go to Calvin. And, and do you have the same impression, Calvin, regarding the progress that we have made during the last two years, or there are so many barriers that we need to tackle? Absolutely. I think, you know, um, for the past two years, uh, because of the COVID, I think uh, the whole world have been seeing acceleration in digitalization, but not only because of the disruption, but for the uh, good of the society, making everything more virtual, making everything uh, more seamlessly, I think, uh, to connect with each other. So I think um, uh, the way that we see it is not just, uh, you know, from a single need or single approach, but it's something that, you know, we will need uh, the whole world. 
to connect through with each other uh, in a combined approach, partnership approach, or through what we call you know, the broader-based uh, world ecosystem to connect through and to make it you know, into uh, some positiveness, I think, to our society. I think through that, I think we see that it's really about uh, you know, how we uh, connect with each other from private to public sector, you know, in terms of how we connect through with other people, but most importantly, how we get ourselves uh, ready uh, for the next digital age. Because the world, of course, right now is uh, uh, migrating and moving in a very fast way. So, you know, from uh, AMT side, uh, we have been focusing a lot into not only seeing ourselves as a connector, but more importantly, to connect with people. So we focus a lot in terms of how we uh, support and cultivating the young talents for their readiness for the digital world. I think that is the most important that we actually uh, get ready the talents for tomorrow. So I think through that, I think it's really not a single uh, you know, a region approach, but now that we are looking for the whole of the Asia region, I think through our working together with the Hong Kong government, with the Singapore government, for every year, you know, the uh, FinTech uh, you know, annual championship, the festival, bring together all the community, uh, but then uh, now that virtually into more, uh, you know, uh, starting uh, off, you know, a hybrid session. So getting more of the gathering of the community, but at the same time, I think providing more support through uh, for the uh, young uh, talents of the uh, community. So that, you know, one thing, uh, you know, we've been doing during COVID, we partner with the Singapore uh, Monetary Authority, Singapore side to roll out what we call the AMTD Solidarity Scheme. So that through grant scheme and also investment scheme, we have been helping over 100 fintech companies across Southeast Asia. So over that, I think we see that the partnership approach over you know, a broader based uh, regional approach to seeing you know, how we can support the society will be very important. Very Calvin, but you, you have told me all the progress that you have made and all your initiative, but, but what about the restrictions, the barriers, the obstacles that, that you may face? I think obstacles are, are many because the way that, you know, uh, ultimately, as when I talk about the partnership in between from private to public, from company to company, institution to institution, you know, in previously, you know, it's all uh, in person. Now that, you know, from uh, a completely, uh, you know, in-person approach, like previously, you know, I will fly to at least two countries every week or maybe sometimes even, even three countries. But now that you know, uh, we have not been, I'm sure everyone, we are only situating in one place. But then you know, I think without the human touch, how we can actually play it, I think, to the same level of indefiniteness, uh, how we can actually drive things you know, through uh, to the maximum. I think we are all adapting, I think, uh, you know, so into the new approach. I think that's number one. I mean, number two is really about how we can get you know, uh, the people, uh, you know, the society, to embrace, I think, the, the virtual channels of things uh, you know, uh, to help them through. Because previously, I think, you know, they are more, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, adapting to the ways that, you know, they see, they touch, they feel. But now that there are many uh, different uh, channels of uh, communication uh, or enabling or empowerment through the internet or through different ways that we can, you know, connect with the world with just a click. So I think this is now the way that we can uh, help, you know, the different society layers uh, for them to upskill, for them to uh, adapt to the uh, new environment, and for them to become more ready for the next challenge and the next opportunity. Thank you, Calvin, for that. And, and now we, we, we're going to talk a little bit with Joaquin about development of capital markets and what are the progress you, you have seen during the last two years, and also what are the largest barriers that, that you may face in, in the future. So, Joaquin. Thank you so much, Eric. I mean, just to um, echo a little bit, I think that not only has COVID, um, you know, kind of enhanced, um, you know, contactless payments and 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 online, but it, what it's really done is driven truck trust and acceptance in these payments. And I think this is really uh, important in a society. And um, the new business formation has not only been in, uh, you know, technology-driven services, but even things such as domestic tourism. I'm sure all of us have seen a lot more of our own countries than we have um, 
anticipated. And also it's really made us realize the importance of supply chains, where things are produced, where they need to go, how we're connected with others in the economy. So I think that's kind of another part of COVID that we've had to keep in mind, both at the level of uh, individuals as well as um, larger companies, smaller companies, and the capital markets that you were asking about. I think what's interesting is that in this past um, couple of years, uh, things such as remittances have actually remained relatively strong in many countries. Um, and so there's been you know, cash coming in. And that um, international capital markets uh, have stayed open. We have seen that even in, in smaller emerging markets, um, certain and there, there's some of the larger companies have been able to tap international markets, um, and uh, that shows that you know we can uh, stay connected, that there is trust, that we can do diligence online, that we can um, you know make sure that uh, companies have access to money to make sure that these global supply chains that I was talking about um, stay connected and that we can all supply each other. I think we're so reliant uh, in the financial uh, ecosystem globally and the trade ecosystem globally is so connected. Um, on the side of the obstacles, and I think you, you've asked on that, is that I feel that still, and you know, before moving uh, back to the US, I was living in West Africa and, and covering countries there. And you see a lot of adoption, as I said, of uh, digital payments. However, it's still very debit-based, if I may, right? So it's people who have cash that then, you know, just pay it down or transfer it to other people. I think um, something that remains lacking is a lack of a credit history. Um, and so people are not able to access, actually access credit. They're just moving money around. And that's not a bad thing, but I think we need to go to the next level where people and businesses develop a credit history so that they can really uh, borrow. I think uh, a second obstacle is that we need to equip uh, businesses with, with financial capabilities, right? How do they report taxes? How do they file uh, uh, accounting statements? How do they really become part of the financial system and become formal companies, which also governments clearly want? And the last obstacle I would say is that we need to really help bolster, especially in emerging markets, an equity ecosystem, right? So a lot of small companies don't rely just on debt to grow. They rely on angel founders, friends, families, and then a, a whole equity system that can help take them to the next level. They don't are not producing the cash needed to pay back regular loan payments. And so we need, and I think this is a good way to maybe transition to um, the public-private partnerships, what, what systems and public policy can be put in place to make sure that small businesses are having access to equity uh, as well as debt to grow. Thank you, Fahin. And an important point that you raise is about trust. So considering the complexity of remaining inclusion challenges, where might public-private and private-private collaboration come into play in terms of reaching full inclusion? So Ryan, Rania, back to you. Yes, uh, you know, we are, we are uh, uh, nine and a half years from the 2030 uh, uh, goalpost that all countries and development partners and stakeholders are looking towards. And financial inclusion actually uh, cuts across seven of the 17 SDGs. And therefore, if we are to accelerate uh, the different uh, fulfillment of the goals, it really requires everyone comes together. So if we're talking about the government, it's a regulation and it's the, uh, uh, you know, creating the environment. If we're talking about uh, uh, you know, and that includes, of course, um, uh, you know, the uh, co consumer protection, the, the, you know, the collateral that was mentioned. Uh, also, what are we doing? You mentioned that one of the most vulnerable groups who are unbanked are women. And this has, uh, uh, you know, they come under more pressure during COVID. So what are the policies that are taken to actually uh, make that uh, part easier? Uh, and then, of course, uh, today with uh, the different uh, companies uh, having ESG at their core, uh, and, and it's, you know, purpose, not just profit, there is that uh, uh, catalyst, if you will, uh, to push uh, for more public-private partnerships in the uh, field of financial inclusion. Of course, we have uh, already successful examples. We have, uh, for example, the uh, Rabobank. Bank. Uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, different uh, initiatives taken by uh, MasterCard and so forth. There's oh, the World Economic Forum. Uh, has uh, also uh, CEO partnerships for financial inclusion. So there are several initiatives uh, that uh, are, uh, you know, tackling uh, the policy dimension 
and trying also to scale up successful examples that could be uh, done from one country to the other. So I believe that, um, uh, you know, in addition to uh, what happens for each economy in terms of positives when it comes to financial inclusion, if you add all that up, we are all pushing towards the global goals by 2030. So these are uh, these are just some pointers. I can you know talk about what we've been doing uh, uh, in Egypt uh, with respect to uh, you know pushing for financial inclusion for uh, women under a national strategy. Uh, there's also uh, regulations that the central bank has uh, recently introduced to uh, to facilitate mobile uh, payments and boost the share of uh, cu customers actively using e-wallets. Uh, this was not the case a few years ago. So, uh, you know, uh, the, the ability, again, improving uh, the landscape for the startups, which is a, a very uh, important uh, uh, element uh, in this. But as Fahim mentioned, uh, the word trust. So we are coming now from uh, a higher base. In the past, uh, people may have been worried uh, that, uh, you know, using uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the e-wallets or going mobile today because they've tried it uh, in a very a difficult experiment, which was the pandemic, I think the door is open uh, to be able to uh, uh, see more gains from the private-public partnerships. Perfect. And, and we're coming back to the specific um, lessons that you can tell us regarding the, the changes and the initiatives that you are dealing with. So in, in terms of building public-private uh, and private-private collaborations, so what is your take, Calvin, about the, the ecosystem that you mentioned all the time to push forward financial inclusion? I, I think the uh, way that we see uh, the particular challenges are really for um, the different ecosystem partners to uh, how they make uh, good use of the connectivity, how they, uh, you know, when we talk about the trust element, but also in terms of, you know, how uh, they see it, you know, the, um, the connection through with each other would help with their businesses. So I think, you know, everyone, you know, when they, um, you know, act uh, to embrace, uh, to react, uh, they need some incentive. So other incentive through, you know, ways that, you know, uh, as a grant, as a money token, or as a way that from the government side, working alongside the private side, that could provide more uh, support, I think, for the, their businesses. I think, of course, you know, different countries have been doing a lot in terms of uh, certain uh, support and grants, you know, for example, for um, the wages, uh, you know, for uh, employees. Uh, but at the same time, I think there are more specific elements. I think all interlinked, you know, with the way that, you know, there are the barrier or the way that for people to kind of, you know, step over to um, entirely embrace uh, the virtual channels. So I think the trust element actually interlinked with the cybersecurity aspect. So it is something that, uh, you know, also interlinked them with the knowledge aspect, you know, whether this is something uh, of a trustworthy, whether it's something that, you know, for the cybersecurity way is uh, very safe and intact, but versus whether you have the enough knowledge to understand through the uh, system architecture to uh, entirely uh, trust and use uh, the different channels. Something that I still see it as from uh, knowledge, uh, education, upskill, uh, onward then to uh, the advancement of different uh, fintech verticals, sub-verticals. So there are, of course, many uh, sub-verticals uh, among the uh, different fintech areas, and uh, the, the world or the universe are enormous. So we've been actually trying to call for more attention, I think, for the community that we set up uh, two things, I think, over the past uh, 12 months. One is, is that, you know, we set up a, a green center uh, of excellence that we want to uh, uh, promote and research more into the green topic, uh, into how that, you know, into uh, whichever way that we as a financial institution or into cross sectors, as we uh, develop our businesses, how we can uh, support more uh, of the environment, uh, you know, and put more awareness towards climate change, how, you know, in uh, each of our individual action or the organization behavior could bring more positiveness to the world uh, future. And I think that is also something that we also putting into more efforts, uh, uh, specifically into some fintech uh, sub-vertical like cyber. Uh, so cybersecurity, we also set up a cybersecurity academy, or we call it also cybersecurity of excellence, that we work alongside with academia, with university, with training institute, with the governmental side, that again, we're promoting more of a training program for the general public, so that they are more aware you know, of the relevant topic, 
so that they feel more not only ready, uh, but then they uh, embrace more in terms of you know what they can understand through uh, the uh, the technicality or the complexity, so that they can uh, have more comfort uh, to make good use of the different uh, newer channels uh, for the new world. I think secondly, I think it's really about uh, how we actually uh, bringing uh, the whole uh, solidarity or the unity of the world that everyone you know uh, go to the par. Uh, or become at the same level so that, you know, we are all more efficient in terms of, in terms of what we can do uh, out of our own capacity and for the organization. Uh, that, that's great, Calvin, because I think education, financial literacy is, is key for financial inclusion at, at the same time. So, but Fahim, do we have the right incentives to build these partnerships? What is your take on that? I, mean, I, I think that um, there's definitely the right incentives because I think from the level, I'll take it from the level of government and then from the private sector. I think from the level of the government, they want to have more people, um, you know, access, um, uh, you know, they want to be able to track payments, where money goes, how money is being spent, and uh, obviously to give people access to uh, the ways to create their own jobs. And um, uh, if, if they have access to credit and financial inclusion, that happens. So I think that's at the level of um, the government. Uh, they also want to make sure that people are included in the formal sector so that there's taxation, etc. And I think from the um, government side, the what really needs to be done is to set up credible institutions, institutions that people can believe in, something the equivalent of like um, the Small Business Administration in the U.S. that is kind of long-term, durable, I think certain countries have set up, for example, you know, SME banks, um, but they have been, um, you know, either small or political in nature. And so, you know, a credible institution may be taken outside the government and run uh, professionally as a quasi institution, uh, maybe in partnership with the private sector could be um, a solution. I think um, another solution um, uh, that could come into play here where um, I think the government would also really um, benefit is to provide technical advice, right? So it's not just setting up uh, banks that could cater to SMEs or to uh, individuals. It's how do they, um, how do small businesses um, set up legal and accounting systems? How do they create financial systems and tax reporting, right? And this kind of keeps the entire economy going, which is beneficial both to the businesses uh, because they need that kind of support and advice. Often entrepreneurs are just kind of creating, running their business um, and not as good at those other things. And, and this is beneficial to the government because this obviously keeps the wheels of the economy turning. And then I think to mention a little bit of what um, Calvin was saying is that it's also in the interest of the private sector uh, if they want to spur innovation in a certain sector. For example, I've seen banks set up incubators or labs within to, to help uh, young entrepreneurs come up with better payment systems, right? The ways that uh, young people or certain types of um, sectors would you know, transfer money to each other. So it's in the incentive of certain businesses um, to also encourage collaboration and have, um, you know, uh, have entrepreneurs build side businesses that they can benefit from. So I think there's um, a whole um, set of benefits from inclusion um, and incentives from both sides to, to push in the right direction. Thank you, thank you Fahim. <clears throat> and now taking the discussion back regarding regional perspectives. So probably Rania, you can tell us something about what are the efforts that Egypt is doing? Because there is always this tension between innovation and regulation, and you, you were part of the government. So what are the, the lessons so, that you want to share with the audience? No, I think that uh, uh, the biggest lesson is uh, you always have to be prepared for shocks, right? And uh, that requires that your uh, investment in digital infrastructure should be ongoing, and, uh, and uh, up to speed ahead of the curve, if you will. And, and for example, in our case, we have a big population. If we had not done reforms in the education sector, we would not have been able to host uh, these many students online during the pandemic. So, so uh, that's the biggest lesson. Reform is a continuous process and you have to always be preemptive. Uh, in terms of uh, also the uh, uh, education and the literacy, uh, and being able to provide the technical assistance uh, for uh, whether it's the SMEs or for uh, citizens. In our case, as Minister of International Cooperation, 
Uh, I'm responsible for the relationship with the different multinational uh, development banks and the IFIs. So we have uh, very targeted programs uh, that the government initiates uh, with the uh, IFC, with the EBRD, uh, with UN agencies to be able uh, to go to the very remote areas, make sure that uh, this type of uh, understanding and education uh, uh, is there. Uh, when we talk about in the region, uh, in the Arab world, there is uh, also with the Arab League and um, uh, there's the Council of Arab Central Bank Governors, Arab Monetary Fund, all of them have uh, again, a financial inclusion task force, which tries to streamline uh, also many of uh, the different, uh, uh, I don't want to say regulations, but, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the pointers or the underpinnings uh, of trying to move this forward. And, and again, the, 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 uh, the biggest, uh, uh, I just go, on, go back to the gender issue because, uh, you know, um, they, are, they are the most uh, unbanked in the, in the region. And um, uh, I believe that, uh, uh, you know, designing, uh, again, uh, special programs uh, uh, for uh, women, pushing them uh, in terms of SMEs and micro lending, this is something that uh, we have also uh, been trying to do. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's again, uh, uh, many of these topics uh, that may have uh, seemed like, uh, uh, you know, uh, just for uh, talks during conferences have become so practical and operational. And everybody has felt them, governments, private sector with the different sizes and citizens, this, the, regard, you know, regardless of uh, what the income brackets are uh, and so forth. You are now knocking on an open door uh, because everyone has uh, actually experienced some uh, of both the shortcomings as well as the benefits of moving forward with financial inclusion. Thank you very much, Rania. And we have only one minute for some uh, final comments. So, Calvin, probably you can tell us something about the AFIN initiative with IFC and MAS. Absolutely. I think the uh, private public sector approach uh, of supporting uh, financial inclusion, we have a prime example, I think it's, uh, you know, our partnership together with the uh, Monetary Authority Singapore, IFC, and the ASEAN uh, Banking Association, that we create this uh, connectivity hub uh, for all the fintech companies to get on board and to provide more user case for them to uh, support, enable, and work with the uh, mid-sized and uh, growing banks or digital banks, I think, in the region. So I think this, uh, you know, uh, uh, level of uh, connectivity through a defined hub, I think alongside a coordinated efforts uh, from uh, private, public, to association type, or including even uh, academia, with lots of practicality uh, in terms of uh, how we provide opportunities, will be something uh, as a good example to share. Th thank you, Calvin. Fahim, a final thought. Maybe, uh, you know, everyone's talked about high tech, but I, I want to give an example from when I was in West Africa of something that can be very, very um, impactful, which is in agriculture, um, just to be able to give farmers credit uh, for storing their agricultural goods, right? So this is kind of pre-product uh, credit, uh, using the agricultural product as collateral. Um, and obviously now I think we've moved to, to digitizing this as well. So I think that um, this can be applicable both in much higher tech, middle income countries, as well as kind of the lower income countries um, that access to finance is not only economy wide, but can be also looked at from a sector lens. That's what I wanted to mention. And to say, how do we make it one sector more efficient including the basic sectors that we, you know, we all need to use every day, be it, you know, um, agriculture, manufacturing, and things of that nature. Thank you very much, Fahim, and thank you very much, Rania and Calvin, for this open and candid discussion about the present global issue. Uh, we learn a lot from each of you. Thank you very much.